gmail.com. What a beautiful and succinct sermon. Yet most will likely take this sermon to be nine distinct situations humanities can face upon the earth. While this can be applicable and describe areas mentioned, it falls short of Jesus' true meaning. Professor Walter Veith, I believe being led in the Spirit of God, unlocked the true intentions of the statements given. That is not a highlight of problems, but a roadmap to salvation. Yes, you heard that right. It is perfectly described the biblical walk of all believers, and we know this is only for believers. From beginning to end, Jesus describes the faithful and those who receive the kingdom of God. So these do not apply to unbelievers in any way. Uh, verse 3, realize that you're poor and spiritually poor. The verse 4, cry out for mercy. Verse 5, be humble before God, right? Understand, he doesn't owe it to you. You're asking for a blessing you don't deserve. Number 6, hunger and thirst to be like him, not like yourself or the ways of the world. Hunger and thirst after his righteousness, right? Then after you've done that, you're begging for mercy. Show other people mercy. Forgive other people, right? And then blessed are the pure in heart. So he's given you the steps of realize your spiritual condition, cry out for forgiveness, be humble before him, hunger and thirst to be like him, be kind and forgiving of others around you, and then you're purifying your heart. This is These are the steps he's given us, okay? said blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see the, shall see god all right we're at the beatitude so if you do all the things in front of him you're purifying your heart realize your need confessing your sins being meek and lowly forgiving other people obeying the truth right and and having love and understanding your situations and then you get to see the face of god Dear Father, we praise you. We thank you so much for all you have our do for us, for being awesome, wonderful, and mighty, taking care of us, loving us, getting us through life, teaching us to not put our, our hope and our joys and our circumstances, but in the one who loves us and what you have planned for us, and that you are faithful in all things at all times, Father. Thank you for this Bible study today. Give us Holy Spirit, God's truth, and help us to understand the true meaning of the Beatitudes and what, how it applies to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The Beatitudes, the real meaning of Jesus' words. So I'm going to read whatever. It says, I recently came across a very powerful perspective on the Beatitudes. I was watching a teaching series called Total Onslaught by Professor Walter Veith from Amazing Discoveries Ministry. Why I differ on some points, I found the series exceptional and well thought out, explained, and Bible-based. Without endorsing everything, he said, I can say uh, that you would have to try very hard to find uh, finding a greater amount of truth explained in such a wonderful way. In that series, he explained the Beatitudes with a novel and special perspective, a way in which I've never heard or considered before, and I must say that I agree with him. So I wanted to share this insight God gave him and then expand the premises even more. Now, I don't really partake in other people's stuff too much, but just because I, um, I just don't like it. Just to be honest, a lot of it's lacking. And so, uh, but there's some people out there that do a good job. It doesn't mean I agree with everything. And I always try to let you guys know that, hey, this is from somebody else's perspective, and I'm not trying to take credit. I never do that. So if I take something that I've heard from somebody else, I always tell you guys. But, and if I reference a book, I try to reference the book in the study so you can look it up. So this is one of those things. It was super awesome. So you guys are going to be excited. So let's read. So let's start with reading the Beatitudes from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 12, uh, 2 through 12. So we're just going to read. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are they who have been persecuted for righteousness, sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all kinds of evil uh, against you falsely for my sake. And number 12, rejoice and be exceedingly glad for your reward in heaven is great for they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So let's read my note. I wrote a note. It says, what a beautiful and succinct sermon. Yet most will likely take this sermon to be nine distinct situations humanities can face upon the earth. While this can be applicable and describe areas mentioned, it falls short of Jesus' true meaning. Professor Walter Veith, 
I believe being led in the Spirit of God unlocked the true intentions of the statements given. That is not a highlight of problems, but a roadmap to salvation. Yes, you heard that right. It is perfectly describes the Bible, the biblical walk of all believers. And we know this is only for believers. From beginning to end, Jesus describes the faithful and those who receive the kingdom of God. So these do not apply to unbelievers in any way. We will cover this in two ways. A simple quick overview. Then we'll go through all nine road signs and given by Jesus and add more scriptures to them. In the first round, I'll explain as I as I understand it. This is based upon Professor Walter Weiss' work, but it's not exactly the same. I say this is not to ascribe to him anything he himself might not agree with, yet I do believe he will uh, not find fault in the expanded view I am presenting. So as we see here, the Beatitudes have nothing to do with nine lists of problems. It's actually the roadmap to salvation. Okay, and so we're going to go over these. And so, num, top of page two. It says, I, I see two parts in Jesus' statements. I will divide them as such. Part one, roadmap to salvation. And part two, what comes next? Uh, part one, roadmap to salvation. Strong uh, concordance G3107. Uh, the word blessed means supremely blessed, fortunate, well off, and happy. So we're just going to go through the quick overview, and then we're going to go deeper. Okay, uh, verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It says, you must understand your, uh, your poor spiritual condition and the need for God's salvation and help. If you do understand, you're set to inherit the kingdom of heaven. So what you see Jesus here is going, if you're this, then you get this. If you're this, then you get that. Right? So the first one is blessed are the poor in spirit. You have to understand how spiritually poor you are. Right. If you understand your, your your depravity before the Lord, then you are prepared and set to be blessed and receive heaven. OK. Number four. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Cry out in repentance and seek God's grace and mercy for your sins. Right. And if you do that, you will receive the grace and mercy you desire in, in the shield of his faith. So it says, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Right. So if you realize you're poor in your spirit, you know, you need help. And then you cry out in repentance and mourn before God. He will come and forgive you of your sins and give you salvation, right? And comfort you. Verse 5. Uh, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Humble yourself in God's grace and mercy. Deny yourself and the world's ways, right? If you do that, that which you are told to deny yourself, the earth and its ways, will then become your inheritance. Yet you must give it up to receive it again. So you have to be humble in spirit. You have to realize you're poor. You have to cry out for mercy. And then you have to be meek. You can't be prideful and make demands or anything like that, right? And if you do these things, then you're set. You're setting yourself up on your salvation walk. Number six, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Desire God and his ways above all else as your flesh desires food and water. Then God will show you his ways and you'll have your desires and be filled, right? So thirst after God's righteousness and being like him, and then you will be filled with that, right? That's the next one in verse seven. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Forgive others as God has forgiven you, leaving you an example of how to deal with humanity and your brothers and sisters in Christ. If you do that, you, when you do this, you ensure the mercy and forgiveness of God upon your own lives, right? So you're begging for mercy. You realize your spiritual state. You're trying to be humble, right? And you're, you want God's mercy. So he's saying, if you want your mercy from me, you have to be merciful to those around you. Verse uh, number eight. Verse 8, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And doing the previously mentioned steps, you will purify your heart before God. You are now assured that you are ready to receive salvation and see your Father God. So let's go over this before we're going on, and we're going to go deeper in there, right? So real uh, verse 3, realize that you're poor and spiritually poor. The Verse 4, cry out for mercy. The verse 5, be humble before God. Right. Understand he doesn't owe it to you. You're asking for a blessing you don't deserve. Number six, hunger and thirst to be like him, not like yourself or the ways of the world. Hunger and thirst after his righteousness. Right. Then after you've done that, you're begging for mercy. Show other people mercy. Forgive other people. Right. And then blessed are the pure in heart. So he's given you the steps of realize your spiritual condition, cry out for forgiveness, be humble before him, hunger and thirst to be like him. Be kind and forgiving of others around you, and then you're purifying your heart. This is these are the steps he's given us. Okay, and so uh, let's go to top of page three, part two. Now that we are saved, what comes next? 
Verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. I see this part as peacemakers between God and the rest of humanity, to go forth to the called ones and bring the offering of peace with God and given by our God, sharing what we ourselves have experienced. And if you do this, is by being like Jesus and standing in the gap between God and man, you also will be like Jesus and become a son of God. A male... All male and females receive the banner of sonship, meaning entitled to certain privileges and rights given to the family of God. Right. And so some people get hung up on the word sonship. It's just a, it's like a, like saying prince or, or title or king or, you know, this type of thing. And so don't get hung up on that. And we have verses to back all this up. But either way, so now that we have we've done this, we purify for God. You see the next part. And and so if I didn't say this, I'm saying this and I, I'm the one that. You know, God had me split it up into two parts, like receiving salvation. Now that you have received salvation and you're out in the world. OK. And so his points was peacemaker between you and God. I don't think that's right. And I have verses to prove why that's not right, because God is the one that makes peace with us, you know, and we respond to that offering of peace. And then we are, are tasked with going on as ambassadors from God to go help him do that with other people. And so but anyways, uh, next one, verse 10. Blessed are they who have been persecuted for righteousness sake for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now that you are living righteously and out in the world sharing the gospel and following the example of Jesus, you have entered the battlefield. You'll be persecuted. Don't fret. You are blessed. And so if you, if this happens to you, it says this goes back to the very first statement. Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, right? So at the very beginning it goes, blessed are poor spirit. Their, yours is kingdom of heaven. Here at towards the end, he said, but are persecuted for yours is the kingdom of heaven. And I said, I see this at, as at first we must understand our condition before God, right? Then here I see at, at it as God understands our condition and our faithfulness before him. We're, so at first we have to understand our need. Then after that, God understands our willingness and faithfulness and we're being persecuted, right? And so he, we have to connect these two, that we have to remain, remain humble and understand our situation. Then God looks at our situation and goes, you love me. You're being persecuted for my name, right? I see now, see your your condition, but yours is the kingdom of heaven because of your love for me. You know, and so therefore he rewards us with his kingdom for the sacrifice, right? And so verse 11. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all evil, uh, all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for your reward is in heaven is great for they persecuted uh, the prophets who were before you. Right. Again, we find another warning in our Christian walk. We must remember that Jesus was perfect and they still lied about him and made up false accusation, accusations just like Jesus. You are blessed when they do this. And if this happens, we get a, a promise. Remember, for every act of persecution, it comes with a much greater reward. God always repays what is sacrificed for his kingdom and name. So rejoice for uh, the reward coming your way. You will be better off than if you were never persecuted at all. I'm going to read that last line. You will be better off than if you were never persecuted at all. Persecution has a multiplying effect. You might give a, an ounce of pain, but he's going to give you 100 pounds of joy. You know, And so we have to understand for every sacrifice, every hiccup, every bump, every ill, everything that we go through in this life, God always repays. Right. And so we're never going to do more or give more than God gives back. Right now, our problems as humans is we want it now. You know, and so that's the hiccup. But God says, listen, store your treasure in heaven where it won't be eaten or robbed or stolen or done away with and it'll last forever. Right. And so when we get to heaven, we're going to be, oh, God, you're so wise <laughs> because now I have my blessings forever, you know, and they won't just be a blessing for the day. They'll be a blessing for eternity. So it says, then Jesus encourages the children of God not to draw back after persecution has come. Remain faithful. Keep pressing on. Don't hide the truth no matter what comes. He also calls us the salt and the light of the world. So I put in a commentary from Albert Barnes, which I really like Albert Barnes commentary. If you're looking for a good commentary and uh, it's an older one, I think it's from 1800 or something. I don't know, but it's, it's old, but um, uh, I like the older commentaries. And so on eSword, you can get a lot of older commentaries. And so I like that. But anyways, uh, so here's what Albert Barnes said in his com commentary on the Matthew 5 Beatitudes. It says, salt renders food pleasant and palatable and preserves them from pu uh, putrefaction. So Christians, by their lives and instructions, are to keep the world from an entire, entire moral corruption by bringing down the blessing of God in answers to their prayers and by their influence and example they have they save the world from universal vice and crime 
I mean, see, I can see Aaron say, hey, I got it. I'm a, I know what this verse means. I don't think I could say it better than that. That's just mm. amazing. He did a great job. And so here's another one from Albert Barnes' commentary concerning light. It says, it is preemptively applied to Jesus in these places because he is the moral world, uh, in the moral world, what the sun is in the natural world. The apostles, Christian ministers, and all Christians are lights of the world because they, by their instruction and example, show what God requires and what is the condition of man. What is uh, is the way of duty, peace, happiness, and the way that leads to salvation, uh, leads to heaven or salvation? In my words, you know, so, I mean, it's great. So now, when we read this next verse, I will get it a little bit better. Top of page four. So with this understanding, let's read the uh, the encouragement and warning. Remember, Jesus referenced the prophets to explain the level of persecution and commitment it'll take for all of us. Also, remember the gift given for enduring the kingdom of heaven, great rewards, and seeing God's face. So Matthew five thirteen through sixteen, you are the salt of the earth. Right? We know what that means now. But if the salt has lost its flavor, what will it be salted? It is then good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under the feet of men. You are the light of the world. A city located on a hill can't be hidden. Neither do you light a lamp and put it under a measuring basket, um, but on a stand. And it shines to all who are in the house. Even so, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Man, so you're over there to be what is in the world to stop the putrefaction, the sin, the sin expri- expanding. Most most Christians don't believe and don't understand, I guess, that their just their presence in the area pushes back darkness. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's why it's so important that we don't withdraw completely from society, but be in it because we're there to help bring people out of darkness into light, right? And so we are that light. We are the 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 you know wherever a Christian is is where the blessings at because that's where God. God's at, you know, but countries and and governments want to destroy Christians because they're darkness and they want to get rid of the Christian because they hate the God that they represent. Right. And so, but here we have this beautiful list, right? And now that we read it, like, you know, uh, that we just did, we understand that the Beatitudes is actually a roadmap to salvation. What happens after you're saved? Well, guess what? (laughs) He tells you twice, you're going to get persecuted. (laughs) You know, I mean, so don't act like that's a strange thing when it happens, but uh, uh, and it will. You know, all live who godly, who live godly, will suffer persecution, and in this life you have tribulations. The Bible said, tells us so. So let's go deeper. So I wanted to get a, just a quick overview out so we can go. Oh yeah, that's really what it means. I just sat there gobsmacked. I just I was watching the video. I was just like, man, that is so great. You know, and I mean, praise God. That's just wonderful. I never heard it that way. I've never thought of it that way. He literally spent like three minutes explaining it. I'm like, and we're doing it a lot deeper because I was like, this, that deserves more attention, you know? And so uh, all he did is just have the verses up. He didn't have anything we're doing right now. But, uh, you know, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to send this to him. <laughs> Be like, hey, I love what you taught. Here's what we did with it, you know? And so it's awesome to see that God reveals truth in a lot of different ways. Let's go going deeper. Okay, so now we're going to prove everything that was just said. Now that we have a foundation of the facts, let's prove what was just taught. So we will keep the formatting from above to make it easier and start adding some Bible verses to expand on all the key points. Matthew 5, 3 through 12. Roadmap to salvation. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You must understand your poor spiritual condition and need for God's salvation and help. Okay, what verse do we have that? Romans 5, 8 through 9. But God commends his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we will be saved from God's wrath through him, right? So we have to understand our need, right? That we he loved us first, right? And that we're sinners and that Christ died. So we have no... We have no skin in the game up front other than we're toast. (laughs) You know, we did nothing for our own salvation. God is the one that did everything, right? So we have no riches when it comes to this spiritual battle. And so we're poor. And so next one. If you do understand, you're set to inherit the kingdom of heaven. James 2, 5. Listen, my bro- beloved brothers, didn't God choose those who are poor in this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him? Now, if people know the Bible, well, they're going to be like, Lance, he was just talking about people who are rich and then uh, with money and then those who are poor. That's not all of what he was talking about. And so I added some more Bible verses just to kind of flesh this out a little bit. So 2 Corinthians 8, 9. 
For you know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that although he was rich, he became poor for your sakes, that you, by his poverty, would become rich, right? And so we have 2 Corinthians 5, 21 and Philippians 2, 27, where Jesus became a curse. He became sin for us. He became poor. That's what he's saying. So blessed are those who are poor in spirit, realizing your spiritual condition. And it said, Jesus came down and became like you, after he died on the cross to suffer a, a, a horrible death and pain that he didn't deserve, right? And the Bible says he became sin for us, okay? And so now we understand, blessed are the poor, right? And here's the kingdom of heaven. So it says, I'll read James 2, 5 one more time. It says, listen, my beloved brothers, didn't God choose those who are poor in this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him, right? And 2 Corinthians 8, 9, for you know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that although he was rich, he became poor for your sakes, so that you by his poverty would become rich. Amen. Okay, let's go on the next one. Number four, uh, verse four, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. It says, cry out and repent and sing God's grace and mercy for your sins. 2 Corinthians 7, 10. For godly sorrow produces repentance to salvation, which brings no regret. But the sorrow of the world produces death, right? So blessed are they who mourn, right? And so this is godly sorrow brings repentance. That's the whole point of this study is that this is a list of a walk of salvation for the, the believer, right? And so here we have a verse that kind of backs that up. Well, more than kind of it does. For godly sorrow produces repentance to salvation. Right. So mourn and God will comfort you. OK. And at the bottom uh, top of page five, it says you will receive the grace and mercy you desire in the shield of his comfort. James four, six through ten. But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Mm -hmm. Be subject, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will exalt you. He will bring that comfort. They're like, okay, you understand your condition now i can do something in your life but god can't work in your life if you don't want to admit that you need his help right now he'll try to try to work around the edges and do this stuff but if you want profound spiritual change you have to understand that hey i can't do this on my own i need someone to help me okay top of page uh number five sorry verse five blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth Humble yourself in God's grace and mercy. Deny yourself in the world's ways. Matthew eleven twenty nine. Take my yoke on you and learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. Right? It said, blessed are the meek. So it says, take my yoke on you and learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And then what is he saying? Be like me. Right? Now, we all know what the yoke of oxen is, where they put it on the oxen so they can pull the, the trough or the trowel or, you know, wedge or whatever you want to call it, or the cart, you know. And he's saying, what is he saying? Take your, take my yoke on you and learn of me. In other words, be like me. He says, I am meek and lowly of heart. I don't exalt myself and you shall find rest for your souls. Right? And so if you want rest for your souls, what is it? part of this is saying, stop struggling. Stop the fight. Stop the battle. You know, stop resisting. Right. So if, a, if a, uh, an animal has a yoke on it, it's meant to do something. Right. And you're poor. You're being pushed in the direction the master wants you to go. You don't worry if you're going here or you're going there. You're just kind of going with the flow and, and trusting his lead. Right. Instead of needing to be in control of every moment and everything, every time God is breaking me of this. I'm tested, I can testify, you know, but I'm slowly learning greater peace and, and greater joy and things that actually matter in life. You know, and I and I praise God. You know, and so sometimes like I'll just uh, just share this with you, like because, you know, I do devotions with my boys in the morning, as I've said in the past. And then I do devotions with the girls. I do devotions with the wife. I do we do family worship. It's like three hours a day, you know, and sometimes I get in such a rush that I'm just like, oh, man, I got I to gotta do this. You know, and I just feel this pressure and pressure. And then I, God helped me realize, like, Lance, the devil's messing with your head. There's no pressure. And it's the best thing you could do all day. Mm -hmm. Don't press like you're trying to get it done or get it over with or, or any of those things. You know, it, it's the single greatest thing you could be doing, you know, and it's the longest lasting thing you're doing. So what I've been doing is retraining my brain is every time those things come on me, I, I was telling me like, this is the most important thing I can do today. This is such a blessing. I get to do this. And I, have, and I keep coaching myself up, you know, realigning my thoughts, you know. And so part of that is and why I'm sharing it right now is because of this god helps you understand your blessings the devil wants you to think what you have is not enough and that you always need more and if it's not the way you want then you can't be happy 
But what God does is brings rest to the soul and helps you understand, well, that's a blessing. Well, that's a blessing. And the devil wants you to do this and not see any of your blessings and, and can rant and rave and complain about how things are going. Right. But and so that's when, like I've said in the past, I read Voice of the Martyrs and these things to help get my mind right to realize that right now, you know, I woke up and, and I got a hot shower and I was able to shave my head to look pretty on camera. And, you know, and we had breakfast and my kids had breakfast. There's Christians right now waking up in streets, waking up in prisons, not getting fed, not having a hot shower, you know. But I'm like, well, I got this to build the pain. I got to build. It's like, well, why are we letting future problems and stuff steal the blessings away that God has given us today? I would be so disappointed in my kids if, like, you know, like I gave an example to my wife. You know, I was like building up the Melissa, my wife, and encouraging her. You know, I'm like, you know, could you imagine if Javen walked up to you and go, what am I going to have for dinner tomorrow night? And, and she's like, what does it matter? It's t today. We're having dinner tonight. He's like, yeah, but I want to know what I'm having tomorrow night. Why do you need to know what you're having tomorrow night? Because I want to know. I want to know. It. I want to see it. I want it to be there. And I want to know it's coming my way. How would that make you feel? <laughs> You'd feel horrible, parent. I was like, you know, not that, you know, we're that way, of course. But it was just an example of what we do to God, right? Because because as a parent, we, my, our kids have never missed a meal, mm -hmm. right? And they've never had to wonder what they're going to eat. But why would you, as a parent, would you want your child to always do that to you? Because mm -hmm. after a while, you'd just start getting annoyed with it. You'd be like, don't you trust me? Don't you love me? Don't you know I love you? Don't you know I've never failed you? Don't you know you've had a meal every night of your life, your entire existence, you never missed a meal. But we do it to God. We're like, God, where are you? Why aren't you, is this there yet? Why aren't we that? I want to see that. Show me the path. Show me the way. He's like, shut up. Have I ever failed you? <laughs> you know, now what the Israelites did in, the, in, in their journey, you know, they complained, you know, and then they complained about the provision. I'm so tired of manna. You know, shut up, you know. And so that's one thing that God's helping me understand is count my blessings, realize my blessings, appreciate my blessings, and don't put like the fear of a lack of another blessing, destroy the current blessings I'm enjoying. But that's all a, a trick of the yeah. devil. You know, and he, he sits there and beats the tar out of us with it. And we're so easily manipulated, you know, and we get so stuck in fear. And so I keep praying like, God, thank you for teaching me these things. Thank you for helping me understand. Please continue to be gentle with me. Let's go. I want to be taught. So don't break my legs. You know, be easy. You know, open up my eyes. I'm, I'm here. I'm ready to learn, you know. But some Christians... They get stuck, right? They don't want to put on the yoke of Jesus Christ. They don't want to be like him, meek and lowly of heart, and just be like trusting the, the one who has the reins in their lives, you know, that like just follow the paths. You know, can you imagine the, the bull saying, well, I want to plow in that field. What about that field? When are we going to get to that field? Well, we still got to make a hole right here first. But I don't know. I want that field, you know. You'd slap that bull, you know. You'd brand his butt as bad. <laughs> You know, we're right here right now today. Let's plow this field, do what I have for you today. So there's many times where we do ministry that I don't know when how I'm paying bills. I don't know how I'm even buying food. I don't know any of it. But I determined in my heart, like, God, you know, I'm going to do my best job. I'm going to praise you. I'm not going to disappoint you. And you worry about that. I'll worry about what you told me to do. I'll be a good bull, plow my straight line, and let you take care of the rest, right? You provide the seed. You put it in the ground. You make it grow. You know, I'll do my part. And so that's the way we have to be. And, you know, we can't let the world get so up on us and all the cares and, and, and the need of control. It's, it's basically, and like we said last time, you know, it's not a matter of survival for us. It's a matter of comfort. Like, I don't want to have to give this up. I don't want to, have to give that. I don't, I like this and I don't like that. And now, now I'm having to do this instead of that. And that's frustrating me. We're spoiled. <laughs> so and what we had, what, what, when that happens, what we're doing is worshiping our blessings or past blessings. And we get mad at God because we're not having our past blessings today. But at the same time, we don't know what his blessings are for tomorrow. He could have magnified blessings, but we're too busy being grumpy today to receive what he wants to give us tomorrow. Right. And so uh, that's why I put out in on our, our group me in, in text about like how blessed we were for Thanksgiving. Because going to Thanksgiving, I didn't know how to buy food. I didn't know how we're going to pay our bills. I didn't know anything. I, I was just like, God, I'm just trusting you. <laughs> you know, come through. And uh, uh, he did, you know. And I'm like, praise God, because I didn't want to have to go through Thanksgiving trying to ignore a bill the day that was due the very next day. You know, that's tough. 
you know, and as human beings, it's hard not to be concerned with those things. But at the same time, God is greater than the bill. God is greater than the problem, you know. And so if we really believe that God rules the universe and he's in control of all things and he's saving our souls and he's keeping us alive, why do we feel the need to reach out and grab a hold of something and go, no, this is the hill I'm dying on, Lord, you know, until I know this, I can't be a content, you know. But if you look at the disciples and what they went through, they had to leave houses and homes and everything and they're just like, follow me. He didn't go, okay, everybody gather around. Here's, here's the three and a half year plan, or I think he ministered for six, but either way, uh, here's the five year plan, three year plan. This is what's going to happen. This is how everything's going to work out. He, he doesn't do that, right? Because what are we trusting? We're not trusting in him. We're trusting in the plan, right? And so what we have to do is learn, don't trust the plan. Trust the one who's making the plan That's right. and be and realize subject to change, Right. And don't be freaking out when it changes. Just go, okay, Lord, you're in control. As long as I'm with you, I'm safe. Without, as long as I'm with you, I'm taken care of. As long as I'm with you, all things are right. Now, there's a lot of people in the world away from God who think they're do, they're good and they're safe and they're right, and they're not. Because look at then the Laodicea it says, you think you're rich, but you're blind and naked and spiritually poor. And, and he and kind of, I think it's kind of a, a mock. Buy from me because you're so keen on buying. Buy from me. You know, it was what he says. And so we have to be on guard for that. Okay, next one. That's what you are told to deny yourself, the earth and its ways will then become your inheritance. You, yet you must give it up to receive it again. Isaiah 60, 19 through 21. The sun will be no more your light by day, nor will the brightness of the moon give light to you. But Yahweh will be your everlasting light and your God will be your glory. Your sun will not go down anymore, nor will your moon withdraw itself. For Yahweh will be your everlasting light and the days of your morning will end. Then your people will all be righteous. They will inherit the land, the earth forever, the branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I may be glorified. So this is talking about the earth made new. So I put some references if you wanted to go look it up. It's Revelation 21, 23 and Revelation 22, 5, right? So he's talking about the earth made new, right? And so here we are. He says, you shall inherit in earth. So humble yourself, become like Jesus. Right now we're in the world, we're worried about surviving in the world and what we eat, what we drink, what we wear, how we're paying our bills and all these things. And God is like, stop that. You're worth more than all that. Life is more than all that. Not that those aren't concerns, but that's not the point of this thing. And he goes, guess what? When it's all said and done with, all this is yours anyways. So, and then we'll never worry about anything ever again. Well, more than we ever need, you know? And so, top of uh, number six. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Desire God in his ways above all else in your flesh, uh, as your flesh desires food and water. Psalms 42, 1 through 3. As the deer pants for the water brook, so my soul pants after you, God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night. Why they continually ask me, where is your God? Right? So here's the thing. It says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Right? So we're told to, you know, as a deer pants for the water, my soul pants after you, God. So I love this because he's saying like, we shouldn't be worrying about what food we eat. We shouldn't be worrying about all these things. We should be worrying about where are you at, God? What are you doing? So as if you blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. So hunger and thirst after your God, right? Here's the next verse. Then God will show you his ways and you'll have desires, uh, have your desires and be filled. Psalms 37, 4 says, delight yourself in Yahweh and he shall give you the desires of your heart. And I put a note there, that being God himself, not worldly goods and possessions. The church likes to use that verse to tell people like, if you desire God, God gives you stuff. That's not what the verse says. It says, delight yourself in Yahweh and he shall give you the desires of your heart. If you delight in Yahweh, Yahweh will give himself to you. Mm -hmm. So when you're hungry and thirst after righteousness, as the verse says, you shall be filled. That's what Psalms 37, 4 says. You will be filled. If you desire God above all else, God will come and be with you. Now, he wants to give you nice things. I'm not saying he doesn't, but I'm saying that's not what the verse says. And people use it all the time. Look, I got a house. I delighted in God. And got it. That's not what he's saying. Right? That's right? You know, I mean, it's misappropriation. Uh, so anyways, uh, number seven, uh, verse seven, blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. Forgive others as God has forgiven you, leaving you an example of how to deal with humanity and your brothers and sisters in Christ. Ephesians 4, 30 through 32. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit 
of God, in whom you were sealed uh, uh, for the day of redemption, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, outcry, and slander be put away from you with all malice, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God has forgiven you, right? So blessed are merciful. He said, be merciful. You put it into all this exalting of self, wrath and anger and slander, all these things where you're exalting yourself. Be merciful to the brothers and sisters in Christ. And what does he say is going to happen? Top of page six. It says, when you do this, you ensure the mercy of God upon your own life. Matthew 6, 14 through 15. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses, right? So what does it say? Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy, right? So if you can forgive other people and show mercy to them, you're securing your own mercy, right? And so it's like the parable he gave about the debtors and one was set free, then turned around and tried to hang up another one that owed him money, you know? And so that's what we can't be. It's like, oh, I got mine, you know, I'm forgiven, forget y'all. You know, that's not what God wants from us. He wants us to love one another and act like he did. So when we see other people in life, I tell people this, like if you're having a hard time forgiving somebody, think of yourself as God and that other person is you. What does God want? What would you want God to do to you? You'd want forgiveness, right? But somehow we feel like we can just choke people with errors and mistakes and problems they've made in the past, right? But if God treated us like we treated other people, right, we would be in no hope. So we are supposed to follow his examples, you know, as far as the east and the west, his sins cast away from us, right, into the depths of the sea. And so that's what we have to do with other people. You know, we have to, like, not hold it on their account anymore be like, okay, guys, we're going to let this one go, right, and especially in marriage. Especially raising kids. You know how easy to, you know, to rack up a tally and a score in a marriage or we're having kids or business, you know, where it's like it's easy to be like, oh, 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 well, man, it was just three days yesterday, you know. <laughs> and so and I praise God that like in my marriage, we don't do that, you know, and Melissa will bring up something that happened in the past. I'm like, I don't I, I literally can't remember it. I'm just like, this is just gone. I just. I, why waste in so much? Says, so you only have so much energy. You only have mental energy, physical energy, spiritual energy. You have to expend it somewhere in your life. But you get to decide where you expend it. If you're going to spend it in unforgiveness, hatred, anger, worry, uh, angst, depression and stuff, well, that's where you're putting your energy. You don't have to do that, right? And so we have to understand we have the spirit of self-control given us to it by the Holy Spirit. It's the forgotten gift, you know, and, uh, and and so we have to understand that we get to decide, just like I was talking about earlier about doing devotions and the pressure to get stuff done, you know, uh, and because like in this ministry, I mean, this is like a one man show and I do it all. And so I have to keep this schedule like, you know, and so uh, it's a lot, you know, and so I, I can, I can can put undue pressure on myself to keep going and. You know, and then I try to find places to push things back so I can get, you know, but I was pushing back in the wrong areas. Right. And so I had to learn self-control, be like, Lance, that's wrong. You're, you're doing it wrong. And I totally understand why pastors get so overwhelmed and they start neglecting their families because the responsibilities of the church are so big. Right. That like they, you know, but that's wrong because the Bible says you can't manage your own house. You can't be a minister. You know, and so you're actually under undercutting your own ministry by doing that. And so, um, you know, so that's why we need to understand these things. Uh, Number eight, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. In doing the previously mentioned steps, you will purify your heart before God. First Peter 1, 22 through 23, seeing you have purified your souls in your obedience. Oh, what? A, what, what? Uh, seeing you have purified your souls in your beings to the truth, to the spirit, and sincere brotherly affection, love one another from the heart fervently, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and remains forevermore. Said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see the face of God. And here we have in 1 Peter 1, 22-23, seeing you have purified your souls in the obedience to the truth, to the spirit, and sincere brotherly affection. Love one another. It's amazing. And so here we have, again, proving the point that was mentioned earlier, but we're going to have something more. Second Timothy 2.22, but flee youthful lust and follow righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Huh? Oh, there it is again. Another one. Revelation 14, 12. Here's the patience and the saints. Here are the ones who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. So how do we purify? Right? We repent. What is repentance? To turn from sinning. What is sinning? Breaking the commandments of God. You cannot say you repented of your sins if you have not determined to stop doing them. 
Okay, that's repentance going, I don't want to do this anymore. It doesn't mean you're never going to do them again. It's just in your heart that, listen, this is not what I do anymore. I am stopping that. I have turned the other way. You know, we're, we're sin abound, grace more abounds, and he's just and faithful to forgive us of our sins if we ask. And so we're not saying we're never sinning. We're just saying, I, you know what? I'm not going to go out and steal for my business anymore. I'm not going to embezzle money. I have stopped that. You can't say, oh, I've repented of embezzling. Are you still doing it? Yes, then that doesn't make any sense, right? But we somehow in our Christian brains and our Christianese, we sit there and make that sense with God. Oh, I've repented my sins. Are you still doing them? Well, yeah. Then how is that repentance? It's not repentance, right? You're lying to yourself. And so we have to understand that in order to fully be repentant, we have to obey God, right? It says up here in 1 Peter 1, 22-23, purified your souls in obedience to the truth to the spirit and sincere brotherly infection. I mean, that is like obedience, truth, and love. Did you get that? You know, I mean, what a powerful verse, obedience, truth, and love. I mean, that's, that's a walk with God, okay? It says, now, if you do these things, you are now assured that you are ready to receive salvation and see your Father God. Revelation 22, 1 through 5 says, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, lit, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God in the Lamb. In the midst of his streets and of the river, from here and from there, was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each yielding its fruit according to one month. And the leaves of the tree were uh, for the healing of the nations, and every curse will no longer be. But the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will serve him, and they will see his face. Oh, it's a beautiful thing. And his name will be on their foreheads, and they will uh, be, and there will be no night there, which we read earlier. And they'll no need a lamp or light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they will reign forever and ever. Right. And so here we are, because let me read it again real quick. It said, "Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see the, uh, shall see God." All right. We're at the beatitude. So if you do all the things in front of it, and you're purifying your heart, realize your need, confessing your sins, being meek and lowly, forgiving other people, obeying the truth. Right. And and having love and understanding your situations. And then you get to see the face of God. That is a beautiful thing. Uh, Part two. Now that we are saved, what comes next? Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. I see this part as peacemakers between God and the rest of humanity to go forth to the called ones and bring the offering and peace given by our God, sharing what we ourselves have experienced. So Psalms 106.23. Here's some examples of why I believe that's what it means. Therefore, he said that he would destroy them had Moses, his chosen, not stood before him in the breach, standing in the gap, mm -hmm. to turn away God's wrath or his wrath so that he wouldn't destroy them. Next one, 1 Timothy 2, 5. For God is one, and there is one mediator of God and of men, the man, Jesus Christ. And so we have this example of Moses of what Jesus is doing for us now, right? How does this apply to us? Let's keep reading. Romans 10, 14 through 15. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe on him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without preaching? How shall they preach unless they are sent as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things, right? So we are the peacemakers. We are ambassadors. We are Christians, little Christ, running around with the Spirit of God in us, bringing peace between God and man, right? That's what our, our whole duty now is, is once we have received this peace and this blessing, we are now to become vessels of peace to bring people the good news of the gospel of peace, right? And so we have to be like Jesus. And that's why I put, so there's you know, you got Moses, you got Jesus, and now we're doing it, okay? Top of page 7, it says, James 5, 19 through 20. Brothers, if any among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know he who turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save a soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Well, there you go. You're being the peacemaker, okay? Now, it says, if we do this, by being like Jesus and standing in the gap between God and man, you'll also be like Jesus and become a son of God. All male and females will receive the banner of sonship, meaning entitled to certain privileges and rights given to the family of God. So 1 John 3, 2 through 6, Beloved, now we are the children of God and it is not yet revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him for we shall see him just as he is. And everyone who has this hope set on him purifies himself, which we talked about earlier, even as he is pure. Everyone who sins also commits lawlessness, sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whoever remains in him doesn't sin. Whoever sins hasn't been hasn't seen him and does not know him, right? And so what are we, what are we looking at here? It says that you will be called the sons of God. And so we have 
First John 3, 2 through 6, it says, listen, you want to are now children of God. This is how you became children of God, that you will be like Jesus and you have purified yourself. You stopped these bad acts. You have obeyed the truth. And now you're going to be like Jesus and be a, a son, have sonship. OK, next one. Second Corinthians 6, 17 through 18 it says, therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing and I will receive you. I will be to you a father. You will be to my sons and daughters, says the Lord God Almighty. Right. And so here we are. It says, come out from him. We have a whole series on uh, leaving Babylon, you know, which I believe we still have more studies. I got a couple of studies series going on, but whatever, you know, I'm sure there's more coming on that. <laughs> you know, I have stuff on my computer to add to it. But anyways, we have a whole series about it. Come out. OK. And so what we have to do is realize that we are now the children of God. Right. And so when, when they when, when to do these things, we have to understand that a child of God doesn't do certain things anymore. Right. You ever known a prince or a princess wondering where who like Jesus gave the example of the a temple tax? You know, does the does the king or the, the prince pay the tax? No, because he owns the kingdom. Right. And that's what we have to get in our hearts and our minds. And that's why I, I told Melissa is like, you know, that God told me, you know, for as much as I love my family and want for them and desire to take care of them and provide for their needs and keep them happy, healthy and whole. God loves them more than I do. Mm -hmm. And we have to convince ourselves of that. Like, listen, God, you love me more than I could ever love me. You care for my well-being more than I could ever care for my well-being. Right. And somehow we think we care more than God. And they're like, God, where are you? I refuse to ever say that. I, I refuse. I'll never say that with God's help. I will never say something like that because, listen, he loves me more than I love me. He loves you more than you love you. He loves your family more than you love your family. He understands your condition. He understands what you're going through. He understands it all. But still, we get stuck in our mind that somehow God just doesn't understand it. We need to explain it to him. <laughs> you know, that like he's not omnipresent, omnipotent, all-knowing, everywhere. And that he doesn't have your life planned out to the day of your demise and death. Or if he comes back and you're resurrected. He, has every, he knows what, what you'll be doing this time next year and 10 years from now if you're still here. Right. And so we don't need to be in a situation where we're constantly fighting within ourselves of how's this going to work out? How's that going to work out? Stuff. Now I'm trying to train myself. I'm like, like we said before, stand in awe of God, what he's going to do. Look for the blessing. Look, now, don't we can looking for the curse of the problem. Right. But we worship the problems instead of the one who can fix the problem. So let's not do that. OK. Now, number 10. Blessed are they who have been persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Now that you are living righteously or out in the world, sharing the gospel, you have received salvation, you're being a, 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 the peacemaker, right? And following the example of Jesus, you have entered the battlefield. You will be persecuted. Don't fret. You are blessed. John 16, 33. I have told you these things and that in me you may have peace. In the world, you will have trouble. I love this. But cheer up. <laughs> so understated. Hey, be happy. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. <laughs> but cheer up. Hey, you know, put a smile on your face. I have overcome the world, right? In other words, don't get long in the face, down in the mouth. You're right. And he's like, eh, just be happy. <laughs> anyway, Matthew 10, 22. You will be hated by all men for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved, right? So we're running a race, right? God, God is like, listen, you're going to be persecuted. Tear up, you know, keep running the race. Don't give in. If this, if we do that, what happens? It says, this goes back to the very first statement. Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I see this at first. Uh, as at first, we must understand our condition before God that we're spiritually poor and we need his help. Then here I see it as God understands our condition and our faithfulness to him. Therefore, he rewards us with his kingdom for the sacrifice. So Luke 22, 29 through 30. And I appointed a kingdom to you as my father has appointed to me that you may eat and drink and at my table in my kingdom and sit on my on thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, he was saying this to the disciples, but I believe this applies to everybody because if you look in the book of Revelation, it's more than sins to see worshiping God. Now there's ranks in heaven. There's positions in heaven. We're determining that now, what you're going to be forever. You know, if you want, oh, I just want to be a street, sweet street, bro. fine, be a street, you know, do nothing for the kingdom of God. You'll be, a, you'll sweep the streets and have fun, you know, but uh, I... I want to do and be close to God. Because if you look in the book of Revelation, those who sacrifice more, give more, and do more are the ones closest to the throne. Those who gave their life are the closest to the throne. I want to be those. I want to be as close to God as humanly possible. So if you don't like God now, if you don't like spending time God with God now and worshiping him now and loving him now, you're not going to like heaven. 
Okay? You're just going to be bitterly disappointed that it's not all about you. Right? And so you get to decide. You get to determine where, what you're going to be doing in heaven, what your position is in heaven, what, what your privileges are in heaven, what authority you have in heaven now by what you do, how you live, how you obey, how you sacrifice, how you give. All these things matter. You're determining it today. All right. And we have to be convinced that this is happening and then we can make right investments, invest into the kingdom of heaven. Right. And store up your treasure there. And so my endeavor is not to disappoint myself when I get to heaven. <laughs> be like, Oh, I should have done more. <laughs> Praise God. Bless the Lord. You know, you're not going to have the ill emotions we have here, but you're going to think, man, God, you're with more, so much more. I should have done more. You know, and I don't want to get to that point. You know, I want to give, go hard, give all I can, sacrifice what I can, just do what I can. And then what he's called me to do. And that way he's not disappointed in me. I'm not disappointed in myself. And I knew that, hey, I ran the race. I did everything I was supposed to do. Right. And so. Uh, Luke 22, 29 through 30, right? Um, did I read that? Uh, he goes back to the verse. Yes, I did. Okay. Uh, Luke 22, 29 through 30. And I appointed a kingdom to you as my father has appointed to me that you may eat and drink and be at my table in my kingdom and sit on the thrones judging the 12 tribes. And then Luke 12, 31 through 32. But rather seek the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added to you. Do not fear. It goes back up to that. Cheer up. Do not fear. Cheer up. Be happy, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom, right? Mm -hmm. And so cheer up. Be happy. Mm -hmm. Realize, like, you know, we're so risk averse in this world. You know, we look at, like, you know, like the people that, like the pilgrims, like we just went through, you know, Thanksgiving and we rewatched the documentary we have by wall builders about Thanksgiving and, mm -hmm. you know, and how they, it was cool because they celebrated for three days. It's awesome. And, uh, but, uh, uh, but anyway, you know, and how, like, what kind of fortitude that you go and like, I'm going to leave everything I own. I'm going to go to a land that I barely know about and I'm going to start a whole new life. And then all the settlers that went from east to west and the organ, or the wagon trains and stuff, you know, and even in, in the time of Jesus and stuff like this, these people that just have this grit that like, listen, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't need to know. But all I know is there's something better that way, like Abraham, mm -hmm. you know, where they just say, you know, God, none of this makes sense. And if you get walk with God long enough, you realize secure, security in the world is an illusion. Your nine to five job is an illusion. Your paycheck is an illusion. Everything's an illusion. And, but we put so much confidence in the illusion that we think that's the only way, but there's not. There's God's way, right? And his way brings us to a, an eternal country, an eternal, uh, uh, investment. And it's something that's going to last forever. Now we're so risk averse that we're so taught that no, we need to do this and we don't need to sacrifice this and we need to insulate ourselves and we need to ensure our future prosperity. And I'm not saying any of that's wrong in the proper context. I'm just saying that's not the point of life mm -hmm. you know it's okay to save for a rainy day it's okay to like do secure things and I, i'm not saying that i'm just saying that's not your reason for existence and if that stuff is preventing you from serving god getting out there and doing something for the lord you have sinned it's like the parable jesus gave him about the guy who built barns i'm gonna be fat and happy and and you know do nothing and just coast into eternity and he's like no nope. jesus is like your life will be required for you were not rich towards god right so God doesn't prosper us. And this is what I think God, God, God allows us to build and to create, to have something to sacrifice. Yeah. We're taught that we're, God gives us the ability to build and create so we can have. No, that's not it. I, I promise you it's not it. He gives us so we, he allows us to build up businesses, ministries, all of it so we can sacrifice it. And if you're not ever walking in a, in a position that I'm willing to sacrifice all I have, I'm willing to sacrifice this ministry, my family, everything, then your heart is not right towards God. You're putting your pleasure and your hope in what you're doing instead of the one you're doing it for. And that is wrong, right? And so we need to avoid that. Now, you're thinking, Lance, this is all hoity-toity stuff. No, I'm telling you from experience, you know? I'm not telling you something I'm not doing. I have never told some people to do something I personally am not doing. And so I can tell you that it's true, that God is faithful. It's not always easy, but it's always worth it. If you look at all the things that Jesus went through, son of man, foxes have holes, but the son of man has no place to live, lay his head. His disciples were so poor at one time with him, they had to go into the cornfields to eat. Mm -hmm. And that was reserved for the poor people. Right. You know, because God says, don't cut the corners of your field. So the poor and the foreigners among you can have something to eat. So this is Jesus Christ who go bread, pizza, bacon, nachos. And he chose not to. 
you know, because God didn't tell him to do, and he only did what he, God told him to do. You're right. And so he's like, well, guys, let's go to the field. <laughs> I got lunch. Let's go to the field. You know, and you look at David and all that he sacrificed that he had to eat the table of showbread because his people were so poor, you know. And so we look at these things that are like, oh, God, how do you feel? We look at in the, the Hall of Fame. It says the Bible's not worthy of these people. But if you look at all that they went through, then you're like, that's horrible, God. That's not what we're learning in church, that everything always goes right. We'll never have to sacrifice anything. Prosperity right. Prosperity teaching that oh, it'll just be an ever flow of more and more and more. Well, it could be, but it might not be. Don't put your trust in either. <laughs> don't be like, God, I'm going to be a martyr. Don't do that. And don't be like, I'm going to be rich. Don't do that. Just be like, God, let it be what it is. Whatever you want. That's what I'm going to do. Don't don't worry about it. Let him worry about it. That's not your concern. Your concern is just the daily obedience. What am I doing today? You know, and so like I heard a pastor fraudulently say, uh, from a guy I was talking to, uh, that you're either entering a storm or leaving a storm. I'm like, there's no storm. Because you want to know why? There's one God. So life might have this and it might have this. It doesn't matter. I'm with God. That's all you need to think about. Well, that was a tough period in my life. And that, no, it's just a period. It's just like, oh, were you with God? Then what's it matter? Mm -hmm. Right? So do you, if you're the scared little sheep being cuddled by the shepherd underneath the tree during the thunderstorm, is that worse than being out by yourself in the golden field? Right. <laughs> no, it's not worse. That's better than being by yourself in the golden field. Why? Because the shepherd's there. Right? And so that's what we have to understand that listen, guys, <laughs> Jesus at the end of the Beatitudes gives us warnings of persecutions, 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 right? And so we have to get out of our heads that there's not this like I hate I like I don't even like to think of life as good times and bad times. You know, what's the point? Storm, no storm. What's the point of that? So I can sit there and constantly try to avert the storm and put all my energy. How about I just put my energy into working with God, loving God, worshiping God, loving God, and being happy with being with him. That's what he's teaching me now, you know, and just let that be enough. And then and no matter what comes, we have not built our house on sinking sand. We built it upon the rock, right? And then it doesn't matter if everything gets taken away or you get to keep everything or you make a million dollars tomorrow or you lose them. Who cares? That's not the point of life. Right. But if people's hearts are settled on these things, then they get to the point where they're like rich people are so trepidatious. They're like, oh, well, I just got this new mortgage and I got this car and I don't want to lose it. And so I have to do this. And that's torture. Who would ever want to be rich if you're constantly trying to fight to keep a blessing? You know, how about you just please the one who allowed you to have it? The Bible says God is the one who gives us the power to produce wealth. Right. And so the devil can do it, too. But you have to turn your back on God to get that, you know, and I hope you're not doing that, you know. And so what we have to understand is that, hey, guys, listen, there's a certain path in life and it has nothing to do with the concerns of this or this or any of it. All, all of our concerns is, is where's God? I want to be with him. If he's here doing this, that's what I want to be. Right. And then you look, think about what you're doing. So imagine like you're with Solomon and you're Solomon's friend. Right. Solomon was the richest man they said to ever live based upon the wealth and inflation, all these things. Either way, he was rich. Right. He could have anything you want. Now, if you're Solomon's friend. Right. Would it matter if would you rather be in his kingdom or with him? I'd rather be with him if he was my friend because I knew wherever the king was, the blessing was. And because the king was going to get taken care of, I would be getting taken care of because I was part of his crowd, his group, his entourage. And so just by being in the vicinity of the guy. I was going to get blessings. Yeah, he has security detail. I'd get the security detail. He'd live in a nice house. I'd live in a nice house. You know, and so now if he went out to the survey his fields, I'd be like, no, you go out to your fields. I'm going to stay at the castle. And that's what Christians want to do. They want to try to stay at the castle, you know, as if that's better than being with the king. That it makes no sense. And so uh, my encouragement to you is stay with the shepherd. So if Jesus was here on earth like he was and he told his disciples, hey, let's go over here. We're going to go uh, do some ministry and we're going to be poor and we're going to sleep out on the grounds. And we don't know, you know, what we're getting our food tomorrow from. But we got food today, so don't worry about it. Most people would be like, no, I don't, I don't think I want to do that. You're making me leave, leave my Internet and my, you know, my cable and, you know, my co uh, frothy lattes from Starbucks and my cigarettes and all these other things. You know, and so anytime we have that where God can't say, follow me, and then we instantly put up a barrier of stuff, of prosperity and blessings, then we're putting that before God and we can't do that. Right. And we have to be like, OK, God, well, it's all yours anyways. And if you walk with God long enough, you get to the point where you realize that he is the one that allows you to have it in the first place. So it's ignorant to sit there and go, oh, no, God, I'm going to disobey you so I can keep these blessings. What well, that didn't work out for Israel. 
Right. He gave him grace for a time. But when that when the time was up, he's like, you know what? I'm done with this. It's all taken out. And it happened repeatedly. It was just like a constant cycle. You know, he just got so sick of it. Right. So we don't want to be that in our in our walk with God and be like, well, God, I'll only go this far. No, stop thinking of the distances. Stop thinking of anything other than where is God? I want to be where you're at. Let's do that. Okay. If you can do that, then all the storms and ups and downs and low, they all kind of just even out and go away because you know that God is there with you. And you might be happy. You might be sad. That's not the goal. The goal is to be with God. And if he brings you happiness and blessing, praise God. If you have to sacrifice for him, praise God. And no matter what happens, praise God. Right? And the Bible says rejoice in him is for the will of God that you do it in all things. Right? And so we have to be to the point where we're like, okay, God, wherever you're at, that's where I want to be. Praise you in all things. Thank you for uh, allowing us to have. And what, what happens when you get this mindset is that you get to the point where you start looking at everything as a blessing. Mm -hmm. Right? Because it's truth. Mm -hmm. You can look at things that you previously just looked over because you're so busy trying to catch on to the next blessing that you look past your current blessings. Right. And you're so worried. Like Jesus says, don't worry about tomorrow. That's enough concern. Worry about today. We do that with our blessings. What's tomorrow's blessing? But we're sitting on top of the pile of blessings we have and we're ignoring them because of what might happen tomorrow. It's ignorant. Right. And so I don't want to be that way. I want to be able to sit down and despite the troubles, the frustrations and angers and all this stuff that we all deal with every single day, this life that we still can sit there and go, I'm still blessed. Right. I, I am still blessed. In my devotions I did this morning with my boys, I read of a pastor that was making baskets for the communists and he was an ordained minister and he wouldn't bow the knee to communism. And so they put him in prison. And then the communist pastors were now teaching the flocks and he was complaining in prison, you know, and uh, uh, to another guy. And he was just like, why would God let me do this, uh, do this to me? I, I'm not going to get the minister to anybody. I've got all the schooling. I'm going to be no use. You know, why is he doing this to me? And the guy said, why are you looking at it that way? God has asked you to share in his suffering of Jesus. Are you willing to do that? Are we willing to do that? I don't know. I hope we are. I try, you know, and that's the goal is be willing that, OK, this is where Christ is at or this is where he wants me. And that's where I will be. And so we all have delusions of grandeur and all this other stuff and all these ideas the world puts on us. But we don't need any of it. All we need is where is God? Where is Jesus? Where does he want me? And let's just do that. He doesn't need, a, you know, a million millionaires. He doesn't need a million passion. He doesn't mean anything other than what he wants and what he needs. And all we have to do is go, OK, God, I'll do that. Right. And so so often we can overlook at the person that, over, that cleans churches that come in on, on their free time and clean a church for free. And nobody gives second thoughts to them. And it's, it looks so menial. But that, that is not menial to God. God is like, this is your calling. This is what I wanted you to do. You're blessing the body. They don't even appreciate your blessing, you know, and what you're doing. But I do. And that's what I need. I don't need a hundred pastors in a church full of a hundred people. I need uh, one good pastor and other people to do other things. And so we all have our calling. We all have our, 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 our duties, right? And so as long as we can just go, God, where are you? I want to do what you're doing. Whatever that is, I'll be happy because I'm with you. Right. And then all these things around you ma are magnified because you're like, you know, it could be this way, but you're allowing me to have this today. You're allowing me to have these things today. You're doing this for me. And this brings appreciation in your heart because you understand you're being like Jesus. Now you're being meek and lowly and not being high and mighty. And I, I deserve this. I want that. I had this, you know, and you're just getting rid of all that junk and just going, wow, what a blessing this is today. That's right. Right. And, 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 and then you can appreciate life and the devil's not playing games with your brain and destroy, getting you to destroy what God is doing in your life. All right. Top of page eight, verse 11. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for your reward in heaven is great. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. It says, again, we find another wording in our Christian walk. We must remember that Jesus was perfect and they, they still lied about him and made up false accusations just like uh, Jesus. You are blessed when they do this to you, right? And so what's the verse? 
John 15, 18 through 20. If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of this world, since I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the world uh, that uh, the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his Lord. If they keep persecuting me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. Right. And so here we have Jesus going like, listen, guys. It's going to be tough. Don't worry about it, right? They're going to revile a person you say evil, false things about you, make up words you never even said, twist everything around. You know, Jesus was perfect and they still lied about him. So when you're doing the right thing in the right way at the right time and your family members and those around you just look at you like you're a complete moron, which I have experience with, you know, um, you know, just understand it, it doesn't matter because all you have to go, where's Jesus? That's where I want to be. And if they're not there, that's fine. They don't have to be, and I want them to be, but they don't have to be for me to be there, right? Because wherever Jesus is, that's where I want to be. And if Jesus says, be here, Lance, then I'm be like, yes, wherever that is, you know? And then, then we become useful to God. All right, so it says, remember that for every act of persecution, it comes with a much greater reward. God always repays what is sacrificed for his kingdom and name. So rejoice for the reward coming your way. You'll be better off than if you were never persecuted at all. Mark 10, 29 through 30. Jesus said, most certainly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brother or sister or father or mother or wife or children or land for my sake and for the sake of the good news, but he will receive 100 times more now and this time houses brothers sisters mothers children and land with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life right mm -hmm. so you i love how we threw persecutions in there <laughs> that, that was not lost on me you're right but here he says listen whatever you give up in this life now that we're at the end of this section of the beatitudes i will reward you for it right but we have to get to the point where we're just like okay god where are you what are you doing how can i be a part of that you know, I just want to be where the king is. And if your spirit's moving here, that's where I want to be moving to. And if you're going over there, I want to be going to, right? And, not, and we're not just rest in this concept of what the world is, of life is a giant game of survival. Life is a giant game of getting more. Life is a giant game of trying to keep bad or hard times away. No, life is not any of that. Life is loving God with your all, all your heart, mind, soul, loving your neighbor yourself obeying him and doing what he asks you to do because listen god needs people that are risk takers he needs people that are willing look at all the missionaries that go around the world going into countries and a lot of them don't even come back because they're murdered and they bring their families with them and they're killed but god put it on heart listen i need you to do this i need you to go here and your righteous holy blood will be spilled and be because of that i'll be able even to do more there now OK, and so we don't need to get risk averse. We need to be like, God, what is your will? Don't worry about the risk part of it. Just say, God, what is your will? How do I be a part of it? Give me strength to endure and I will just keep following you in your power. Mm -hmm. And you then that's what you do. And then by the time you're done, you know, like I look back at what this ministry has been able to uh, do and create and the website and all the sermons and stuff, you know, and periodically, you know, we don't get a lot of downloads every day, maybe average 10 but every now and then we get these spikes we're getting like 90 and someone would do 60 or 40 you know someone gets really excited about getting some gospel teaching and download a whole whole bunch and that happens like this month we uh, went over 600 downloads this month on our podcast i mean to me that just warms my heart and makes it worth it because people are owning these things and keeping them with themselves and i pray that they go out and are shared and go other places so we'll never know the full end of it all but you know that's the kind of stuff that we have to look at that like you know, because of the sacrifices of believers before us, we have our Bible. Before, Because of sacrifices like the pilgrims that came to this world to flee religious persecution, we have a Christian nation. You know, and it's only because people were not risk averse and they're willing to sacrifice, do without and press on, that gets something done. And what do we look at our Lord and Savior? He left the kingdom of heaven, came down to earth, became poor like us, right? Bore our sins, become something he never was. The Bible says he became sin for us. Right. Was he risk averse? No. He was like, this is what has to be done. It takes risk. Now, ask anybody who ever started a, 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 a good company, you know, that becomes profitable and stuff. It started with lots and lots of sacrifice, lots of risk, lots of effort and a lot of unknown. Look at our farmers. They deal with it every single year. They don't know if the crops are coming in. They don't know what's happening, but they have a hope and a dream and a vision. Right. And they go out there and they plant and they work and they toil almost all year round for harvest season with a hope. Mm -hmm. And now what they say, like 3% of the uh, the earth's population feeds it. 
three percent. I mean, that's mind blowing. You know, sure. you know, but it, the farmer lives with hope, and Paul references that that you know the plant seed and early in the latter rain. You know, and so that's what we have to do. Don't be risk averse. Be like, okay, God, let's invest into something great. Get a great return and be wherever you're at. Okay, so closing. I hope that the next time you run across the Beatitudes, you will remember this study and to think of the roadmap left to us by Jesus. Let us also recall the Sermon on the Mount was for believers only. And lastly, may we all be encouraged to stay the course, uh, to be the salt and the light of the world in Jesus' name. Then we'll receive the reward and the desire of our hearts, our Father God. Okay, and I put the Beatitudes, the real meaning of Jesus's words. Let's pray. Dear Father, we praise you. We exalt you up. We lift you. Thank you so much for calling us, Father. There's so many great witnesses and believers that have come before us that sacrificed everything, gave everything, you know, so we can have what we have now. Let us not be the end of that chain. Let us also sacrifice great, give great, not be risk averse. Be willing to take the the chance to just follow you, to step out the boat and just keep pressing forward to spread your gospel. It's, that's what it's going to take here at the end of time, Father. It's only going to get worse, as you know. And the body of Christ has to wake up and get rid of the baggages and being willing to step out and to be the salt and the light and be a part of the end time harvest, Father. So I pray that all the people here today of this study and all these people online will be a part of that and help others to be a part of that, too. So when you come back, you can find your servants working and we can be called good and faithful, faithful servants like the parable. So we praise you. We thank you. And we love you very much. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. 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 If you feel so led of the Lord and want to know how to donate to this ministry outreach, please visit BrotherLance.com and scroll down to the bottom of the main page for the PayPal link. Thank you, and may God's blessing rest upon you. BrotherLance.com